Next up, data intermediation and data altruism in healthcare. How to empower patients. The stage is yours. Thank you very much. Sorry for the delay, but uh, we have some technical problems with this slide. So what we want to talk about here is the business case on uh, healthcare, or the use case in healthcare. And what we want to actually look at is from the perspective of the legislation that we all know are quite interesting and good, and they are paving the way for effective data sharing uh, for the benefit of the citizen and of the patient. But this is enough. Are the citizens or the patient truly empowered thanks to those legislation? And are the citizens truly seeing the benefit of it? And so in this session, we will look through three use cases and uh, look at how we should build the regulation to empower patients, uh, to consider all data intermediation and data altruism could maximize the benefits for the patient and what it means in terms of potential additional infrastructure that we need to have on top of everything that we see there. I'm first going to spend really five minutes, not more, on introducing the different regulation there. Fundamentally, I summarized each regulation in one slide, which was a challenge, and it's not complete, but it was more in the context of patient and data intermediation. And then we will go through the different use cases. I will start with the work we have been doing in My Data for Pandemic, and what we think is important there to support uh, citizen, and so that things can be done by citizen and not just for citizen, as we do today. Then FP and she will introduce herself as well. We discuss about the platform that they uh, working, uh, they've been working on, which is VR, uh, to share her data. And then uh, Rico, I think, will have more of an open discussion about the Registry Registry, which is something that was described already yesterday. Um, I'll let the speaker uh, introduce uh, themselves. Um, uh, maybe myself, I'm a physician and a computer scientist, 30 years of experience in healthcare and in pharma, and the last three years have been focusing much more on personal data sharing. Um, to finalize the discussion, we will actually um, look at, uh, with the three speakers, about what we think in terms of can we involve the patient. So, um, about the introduction about the regulation. It's by definition not correct, but I've been trying to actually represent data individuals and citizens. So let's look first at the Data Governance Act, which was approved in December 21, the invitation for citizens and the concept of data intermediaries, uh, where we really need to have separation of different type of foreign and, 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 and judiciary duty. Um, what goes into that data for the data holder and the storage needs to go somewhere else. Um, those intermediary needs to be approved by um, a competent authority, which certifies that they are truly uh, a, a legal data intermediary, and uh, the data intermediary, based on request and consent and all that, can actually um, uh, share data between the patient, citizen, and the data user. On top of that, you have data outreach organization, where the regulation says that they can actually get the data or directly from data orders, or um, they could actually get it from data intermediaries. In a nutshell, the data governance act. There are many other things in there, but again, it's just based on patient intermediary. The data act. The data act basically says that if you have a user uh, using a product, then um, he actually, when he does that, he can request to transfer the data uh, from the data order to data recipients, and those data Recipient means it can be data activity, cloud service providers, and top of data um, And the data recipients need to be paid a reasonable compensation, reasonable to be out of exactly what, but needs to actually be reasonable to cover the cost, nothing more. So it should be very easy for the patient to ensure portability of the data to many different customers. The one thing I have as a major concern about the data act is that in the context of the public sector, uh, the public sector can actually request directly data from the data holder um, in very exceptional cases like pandemic or health crisis or like other urban situations, but it does not even need to inform the patient, which is for me completely unacceptable. It doesn't have to inform my data perspective. There's no concept for information. Then we come into the, the data page, uh, the EHDS, 
which from our perspective is very much uh, auto, uh, what I call a data autocracy, as it is defined today. I think there's a lot of fantastic things in there, let's be very honest. Um, one thing that I'm very much concerned in the context of healthcare is that they completely separate the clinical care delivery, which is your provider, and the clinical research, which is done by pharma company, by uh, public health authority, and there are a lot of authorities. I'm not going to go into the detail of this, but if I am as my data, what I would rather have, and that's why I described all the uh, first time before, is everything central around the individual, where all my data as a citizen feeds clinical care, clinical research, social determinant of health, which is very important, are all managed by my data intermediary, uh, which is providing the service I'm um, asking. And then we can actually share the data with your authority as the EHGS is asking, but that is a truly data centric view, um, individual centric view, which is absolutely not what we currently have in the proposal. So we're certainly going to pass comment to the uh, uh, Commission from my data describing that much more. No, where is the patient involved? In the EHGS, as it tends to be, is completely disempowered. It's not involved. That is absolutely true. But let's look, you know, practically um, in, in very specific uses. My data for pandemics has been working on that. And uh, so, what do we propose? Because it's nice to, to, to criticize, but we better have a solution to actually propose something concrete. So, the context of pandemic, by the way, last week I was in the, the meeting and um, where two experts said we have to do them of the COVID pandemic. Bad news. We are not yet at the end of it. So, um, but anyway, what we know for sure is that COVID is one pandemic, but we know that they are going to be worse, a more little uh, outbreak in the coming months because of climate change. It's definitely not the last that we are going to see, and we just don't know when was the new thing really going to happen. That's not the question. So, what we want to do is to make sure that when the next one comes, we can actually scale up very quickly a solution so that the outbreak does not come from really into a pandemic. So, what is happening today? Citizens are basically kind of protected, so everything is done for us. Um, and we actually get from public health authority a lot of information, as is for everybody, it's not, nothing specific for us. Uh, and they also get a lot of our data, so those are anonymized, but that's not really anonymized. And um, uh, what we want to do is to actually transform that into something where we concentrate everything around intermediaries, where the citizen can also use that to pass the digital certificate. You probably, all of you have a digital COVID vaccine can share the data with the authority, can, um, and uh, also then um, the authority can have uh, information about the whole pandemics to actually support the citizen uh, and provide truly guideline about uh, what is important for that specific citizen in that context. So what we really want to do is to do is stop going from, and I'm sorry for the slide, but it's not very good to the mind, we want to do something where the citizen is not empowered, there is huge pandemics, people are not trusting government, to something where based on the intermediary, the citizen is empowered and there is trust. Um, I may not go through all the slides because we don't have the time, but there's something I want to, just a few things I wanted to add. We checked with the citizen what was important for them, and this is the first thing. They wanted to have this trustworthy information based on their context. Uh, but you build your the context of the citizen based on the data of the citizen. So it's very important for the data of the citizen. The second thing is that, yes, they want to maximize freedom of movement because they were there um, so they can minimize the risk of contagion. And they are happy to share. Sharing of data for most of the citizen and patient is not a problem as long as they know what's happening with them. So, uh, it's not a really other one. Uh, I'm going to skip a lot of those ones because we really don't have the time. But the, the old idea is to actually support, and this one I'm going to go a little bit more detail, is to support citizens with intelligent assistance. So that you can say, hey, can I visit my parents? Well, give me your the address of your parents. Uh, well, as in fact, the address you gave me is not correct because you did it in Belgium, and the address of the code was not correct. So he knows about me. 
then okay, I'm ready to check if you can go. Well, sorry, based on your data, but I have, you better stay home. Well, uh, why? Well, it's because I wonder what is your contact external. If you update that information, your contact tracing application or proximity tracing, then, then we can check. So I update that and uh, with the support of the insurgent assistant, and then we check and say, okay, now you can go. So here you already have a tool to support the citizen based on what the context is. Um, and I'm not going to go through those one because we don't have the time. Let's go through them. So, um, conclusion, and, and I will have to be very, very tough. I'm sorry for this week, you don't forget um, How do we build on regulation to involve the patient? And have you done that? Yes, okay. How great to. So, um, if we want to involve the patient, it's not enough to have data in the books. Uh, it's not enough to have all those things that we have to do uh, uh, regulation. We need to have other things in them which are a set of services to truly support the citizen. If you think about citizen and patient, do not really care a lot about the data, they care about getting the benefit of those data. So we need to actually add those services. The one thing is that, is data free? Can I give all my data in the context of pandemics? Which is, by the way, we don't give our data, the authority take our data, and they know a lot about us. Uh, I don't think data is, is an acceptable option because uh, organization and uh, authorities will actually know everything about ourselves. Um, I think it's a better that we can organize uh, all data and then share with the authority, which is possible with data intermediary. And um, what do we need in terms of solution? In terms of infrastructure, I really think that if you really want to increase the benefits and the uptake of data sharing, we actually need to have much more of those virtual assistants. If I ask you, how many of you here are using uh, one? If you can manage everybody, how good? If I would rather ask who is not using the right one, if you can manage all your data with this one, like you do with this event, uh, then it is really good for you because uh, it's really applicable to you. It would actually make a huge difference. And that's the kind of thing we need to do more, giving additional control on parts of what it uh, currently with the data of the legislation. So, with that, I'm going to leave the world to and that's all the people who contribute to the work. So, I think maybe introduce yourself to the panel. Yes. Hello everybody, um, I'm Nati Hussain, I'm working at VITO, uh, which is an organization in measuring on sustainable uh, technology uh, and sustainable society. And in that context, we've been working on health data. Uh, so I'm going to talk about VR, the platform we're developing, uh, which is a citizen-centric data platform to uh, share health data. Um, so how do we deal with data today? I won't go into much uh, detail here because I think everybody knows the current system is uh, application-centric where all our variables, uh, devices that we use, uh, collect our data and store them uh, themselves and not much is uh, centrally uh, kept. So that raises questions, of course, uh, for the citizen. Um, they don't know where the data is, how it, um, it is stored. Um, whether it is managed in a good way, if you can get good feedback of how it is used. Also, if you want to share with other institutions like government, industry, uh, or for research, uh, they have very good possibility to do so. Yeah. On top of that, we have a bunch of socio-economic trends uh, that are both global and European, uh, also mentioned uh, over the past two days quite a lot. Um, so the personalized products and services uh, that have been developed in the last couple of years um, to really uh, have a data economy today. Um, the shift towards open data and, and the push towards innovation uh, based on that open data. Um, and especially in Europe, uh, privacy and legislation to protect and engage the end users. Now these trends uh, seem so, so contradictory. You have the personalized products and services, which means they need personal data, but you also want to protect and engage end users and, and have the privacy. Uh, so that's, that sort of needs to be figured out how, how those things can work together. 
Uh, also, what we saw, the, the big data companies like Facebook that, that have a sort of monopoly on, on your data as well, and how you shift that towards more open data and, and more equal playing field. Um, so that's why we're shifting to a new way of dealing with data, and not only us, I think everybody here um, over the course of this conference. Um, what we're doing specifically is building a citizen centric uh, ecosystem for health data. Uh, which means that, that we can create and um, capture personal health data such as wearables, such as telemarketing devices, such as information in your medical file, and really put that in a uh, personal data storage. Uh, but on top of that, we have a layer that uh, builds functionalities on that uh, to communicate with, uh, with third parties. Um, so if you give consent, you can uh, share the information with whoever you want, uh, civil society, uh, public authorities, industry, academia. Um, so our innovation is possible, and then we have the separation of data and service, uh, where you can get personalized products and services in return. Um, and that's the VR platform with a third important layer, where we have organizational and data governance as well, um, on top of all the data storage and functionality layers. So this is being developed um, in Flanders and in Belgium today. Uh, we have uh, some initial events, uh, investment that we got within the regular initiative, the Smart Health uh, Initiative in Europe, um, from the Innovation Cabinet in Flanders. Um, and recently, uh, three cabinets uh, actually in, in Flanders came together to really fund uh, and kickstart to be our platform. Um, so we not only have innovation, but also digitization, uh, the cabinet there. Um, and the health uh, uh, and administration all coming together and funding this initiative, um, which is already quite an achievement to get different governments working together to, to fund an initiative like this. Um, and the VR platform is not something that we do is building by themselves. We involve actively um, the health sector and citizens and uh, patients in this. Um, so we involve uh, Thomas Medica, which uh, is a big GP organization in Flanders. Uh, so you know, which is taking care of um, hospitals and care institutions. Um, so we have been to them. We have uh, Laos Patient Platform. Uh, it's, it's, it's an organization that covers uh, patient needs. And the King Baudrillard Foundation there, uh, there you can see on the slide, um, is working towards empowering citizens uh, in all members of uh, society. Now, the technology that we're using uh, for the data storage layer of the VR platform is solid. It's been mentioned quite a lot uh, this past few days as well. Um, it should be developed by Tim Berners-Lee. Um, so it makes the reuse of data possible because you have these personal data pods uh, where you can store your personal information. Um, also, we're not the only ones using this in Flanders and in Belgium today. Uh, also being widely adopted um, by um, digital Flanders um, to implemented across a wide range of fields, media, transport, uh, etc. Uh, so really being pushed and pushed today and uh, we see as the, the core of the data storage of the platform. Um, then on top of that we have um, the organization layer because the technology is not enough, not enough in our view. Um, it's not enough that you just have the personal data vault and then leave the citizen to fend for itself. Um, especially with health data, we feel that there is an important ethical and, and uh, governance need that needs to be addressed. Um, if an insurance company can convince you to, to share your data, is that really consent? So what we're looking at is really um, creating trust within the platform and adding that organization and governance layer. Um, to do so, we're using the King Borderlands Foundation's guiding principles of care technology, which you will see here. Uh, I won't get into detail, but the, the essence is that in, uh, apart from data-centric and uh, citizen-centric data collection, it's also about that citizen-centric technology that you really engage your end users uh, in when you develop health technology and uh, to see what their needs are, um, how it can work for them, uh, that you really involve them in every, in every step of the way, that you have really truly informed consent and not the things you just check to, uh, to get it over with. Uh, another important part is uh, that ownership and control of the personal data and that goes together with digital and health literacy. Not just say people really have control and um, figure it out, but really help people and it is uh, uh, sort of an assignment to, to companies as well to really think about informing citizens and patients about the technology they are using uh, and how they can help. And then lastly we have uh, the quality and very coherence principle that, uh, that also 
um, to make sure that technology that you are using um, uh, has a, a quality label. So in the end, as I said, a level playing field. Um, so uh, uh, innovation is possible, citizens have more control, you have a, a really nice balance between, between uh, uh, trust and innovation there. Now this is the theory I, I explained, we are going to build this platform, we also have some initiatives and because we are talking in this session about empowerment of the patient and how do we do this in practice. Uh, I'll show you some practical examples of what we are doing in developing this platform to really involve the citizens as well. So the first one is BBOP, it's a preventive uh, care application that we uh, developed on top of the BR uh, building blocks. Uh, where we provide tools for self-management, uh, for self-management on health promotion and prevention for uh, citizens. And really the whole core of you is uh, getting co-creation and participation of that citizen in the, uh, in the whole process and also involving all stakeholders like local communities, like care providers as well. Um, so, just as what is happening in VR, we create and capture personal health data, so real-world data, it can be surveys, um, it can be wearables, um, all sorts of uh, information that gets collected. Uh, we now have a little background, lifestyle, uh, behavior and personal preferences in there, um, so people can put that in their personal data holes. Um, as I said, we use that in the, the solid pot. And then the second step is the reuse of the data. So the data are in there, but within BBOP, um, the data gets reused um, to offer people some additional advice. So they get an overview of what their risks are um, in developing chronic disease, whether they should move more, smoke less, um, that sort of thing. Um, during the height of the pandemic, we had a COVID risk calculator that took some of the risk factors uh, that we collected in the data vaults and sort of calculated the risk people uh, could get uh, COVID or get uh, serious complications, or, or at least the, the, the chances they, they got to, uh, to those risks. Um, we also offer local activities, so say you need to move more, then where in your surroundings you can go for a walk, uh, you can uh, take part in, in classes. Um, so it's all the use and efficient use of the data we collect. And then the citizen is at the center of this. Um, so we're really looking um, again those those scary technology principles uh, that we try to adhere to. Um, we look at the health and digital uh, literacy, uh, working together with organizations that uh, really empower patients to do this. Um, we give really true informed consent. We explain in, in uh, easy to understand language what we are collecting and why and how they can control this. Uh, and developing uh, all the applications, we're really looking at in the center of design, so really in co-creation with uh, the end users here. Now, the second way uh, within the VR platform we are looking at empowerment is looking at the care technology principles, so I mentioned them before, uh, but they're not very practical in use. So for health organizations and companies, you want to develop really blueprints and toolboxes that they can really make practical use of those building blocks. Um, so we have a toolbox to say um, which care technology principles do we apply only today, where can we improve, uh, look at good practices on how to empower and involve your patients, um, how is their literacy level, do you need more information, how to involve them, are they up to date with innovation or do they need additional help. Uh, and lastly, also workshops, uh, because if you're uh, applying uh, um, health technology in organizations or in care institutions, also um, healthcare professionals need to be able to, to work with these technologies to also involve them in the whole process as well. And then lastly, um, also looking at the governance layer uh, and really looking at the stakeholders there, uh, developing possible business models. Also here we're looking at all the stakeholders, uh, so companies, citizens, healthcare providers, government, uh, research and innovation, um, and we uh, really uh, consult them all the way on, on what value this system could uh, have for them. So that we have the, the CA Data Project, which is uh, sponsored by the Innovation uh, Flanders Fund, um, where we really look at all the people uh, in the, the Pentagon, so the individuals, the government, the companies, knowledge institutions and investors, we really ask them what they are uh, looking for and building use cases and business cases with all those stakeholders to create value for them. So in terms of empowerment within the VR uh, platform, we want to be really implement that on every layer of the platform um, through the co-creation uh, and from the citizens in the applications. 
um, to create value at the core of the platform um, and, and, and really getting the ethics uh, at the center of it and involving uh, citizens uh, and putting it really into practice. And then lastly, involving all the stakeholders in the entire process in building the business cases. I mean, yeah, the previous ones <laughs> disappeared. So uh, I'll go to Riku now. Okay, thank you. So in, in the interest of, of uh, avoiding an international law, uh, I'm, I'm skipping the slides uh, and I'll just talk really for a few minutes about the, the project we are doing. Uh, so uh, we are building a, a European rare disease registry and, and why is it European? Uh, the, the reason is that nothing really uh, works on, on the national level. Uh, uh, because rare diseases, as, as their name is, are rare. And you can have only a few patients in, in, a, in a particular country and you cannot build meaningful data sets in, in a single uh, member state. So you need a, a European solution. And, um, and uh, the European health data space uh, seems uh, possible as, as, a, as a solution, but of course it is not yet in, in, in place. It's uh, something in, in the works and there is a commission proposal. Um, but we, we really need one set of rules, uh, one European solution. Um, because of, of the... Uh, uh, and um, I would say that uh, often in, in, uh, in Europe we have uh, uh, maybe uh, too many arrows, so we have uh, uh, solutions where there are a lot of boxes and arrows and there are just too many arrows. Uh, so we need, need something quite simple and uh, something that, that is manageable for, for a, a non-expert um, to then to, to manage themselves uh, uh, on, on the basis of uh, my data principles. Um, and uh, these are all very complicated. So uh, it is complicated on, on the medical level, uh, the medicine is difficult, uh, it is complicated technically, uh, all the data science, uh, the IT, the different IT systems, the, the apps, very complicated. And, and then th there is uh, the legal difficulty. On top of this, you have the national regulations, you have the EU regulations, you have one set of rules for primary use of, of data to, uh, for care use, and, and then you have the second set of rules for secondary use of data. Um, so, um, I don't think that there is one single institution or, or person who could kind of have an overview of everything that, that's, in, uh, that's kind of going on. So uh, what, what we are doing now is, is uh, uh, we are uh, having a, a competition, a uh, sort of design, design competition, uh, and we are, we are involving some students, uh, and, and uh, we will have a, a kind of a competition of ideas. Uh, for this European rare disease registry this, this autumn. And, and uh, if you're interested as a, as a mentor or uh, a competitor, you can just uh, uh, say hi to me and I'll, I'll give you the details. Um, so so what, what really is, is the, the kind of the, the crux of the, of the problem with rare disease is that uh, there is a massive data gap, so uh, there just isn't enough data uh, for there to be informed uh, diagnoses, uh, and and then uh, uh, then of course uh, uh, 
also there is a lack of treatment. For, for 95 percent of rare diseases, there is no approved treatment. Um, to 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 get to solving this problem, you first need to solve the the, the data gap, and uh, you need a, a kind of a, a data generator and, and a data integrator that can then uh, provide the data for better informed uh, diagnosis, uh, and then you can develop new therapies. But that, that is a, a kind of a, a long way, and, and first you need the data. And, uh, and there are about 600 uh, different registries that have rare disease data in, in Europe, so it's, it's very fragmented. Uh, and uh, the data is, is uh, in, in different silos. The patients are in, in uh, there are about 30 million rare disease patients in Europe. They're in, in different places. And, um, and also the doctors are in, in, in um, the, the experts are, are scattered around. So, uh, so you, you need uh, all these three groups. Uh, uh, kind of the, the, the data sources, the patients, and, and, the, and the healthcare professionals to, to be accessible again under kind of a single set of rules, a single um, uh, framework. There is something like that for, for, for the doctors, uh, the European reference networks. Um, but there isn't something like that for patients, really. Um, and it's kind of one-sided at, at, at the moment, as, as, as you were mentioning, that uh, the data provided by the patient doesn't necessarily inform their own care. Uh, and uh, it's, it's sort of one-sided. And, and you need, need to have a system that works both ways. Uh, uh, and. Uh, is, is, is compatible with these, these uh, principles of, of uh, fair, uh, fair principles. So the, so the data needs to be findable, accessible, interoperable, and, and, and reusable. So that, that, that was all I was going to say. Thanks. <laughs> Okay, before, yes, so we, we want to actually, we want to actually do for in this second, before going into the discussion, I think we want to do the question of the audience. Yes. Thank you for the view. Okay, you mentioned about the city, the view emphasized on people. So, uh, and you are representing from Belgium or Flanders, but you should make in the whole Europe. And how is uh, the people's mentality depending on the rich country? So, how can you collect all information from different people? Especially, COVID makes people like it, but if it's not COVID, maybe different. So how can you make this uh, activity when there's COVID? <laughs> There's that in the house of between different people. Um, so yeah, I showed the, the map of Europe. So we're developing um, the VR platform in, in Flanders in Belgium in, in first instance. But we're also collaborating with East Netherlands and OU in Finland um, to look on collaboration. And then we believe that we can have a similar platform in, in different countries, but really taking into account also the sensitivities and, and the local regulations as well. So we don't propose to, to really flat out copy it to the whole of Europe or, or the world even, um, but really look at each region and see what the sensitivities are and how you can work uh, with citizens um, at a local level as well. But yeah, the, the European framework is to really look at, at how this could work and how this could work interoperable across Europe, and that's why we're working with the different regions. So it's, it's a starting point we have in Belgium that we like to expand, uh, but all while we're taking the local um, like regulations and sensitivities into account uh, to really help the people trust that they have in their own region.
Hi, and uh, thank you for the introductions. Um, I had a question about the term health data, which at least in my data consists of a lot of different things. For example, allergies, which I would want to share with anybody. Uh, infectious diseases, should I be allowed not to share that? Medication would be important for any treating uh, physician, etc. My psychiatric history, for example, things like that. How do you look at sort of the different categories and not just call it all health data? Okay, thank you. Well, they are all health data. It doesn't mean that they are necessary to be shared in the same way. That's exactly. What you can do with consent is try to be selective data you want to share, or you want to stop sharing, uh, or you want to be forgotten. That is exactly the also what is in the HDS, the kind of thing that you can actually do. But you're absolutely right. I think you want to share things that you don't want to share. Um, there's <clears throat> in the context of data is a bit more difficult because basically you give all your data away so it would be much more difficult to actually make the distinction, but even there, you could actually consent to share only part of the data based on the consent. Uh, I think, why is that really a problem? Um, because you can decide. So I, I don't understand what is the concern there. It's, it's because it's sensitive? Uh, yeah, I can maybe um, add some, uh, because we've been uh, also looking at the principle of like a genome pod and there it is really uh, because maybe there is some stuff in your genome you don't want to know yourself and then like, can you shield it from yourself when you're involved but maybe you don't want to know yourself whether you have this, this very uh, yeah, genetic uh, predisposition to a type of cancer but maybe you want to share it so those are issues indeed that are not solved at this point but, but, but um, are relevant and, and you, I think you need that different layers of access of control and also of, of actually seeing what is in the data. But it's, it's all health data, and so it needs to be tackled in some way. Um, and we think it needs to be tackled in a different way than, than just your address information or your contact information, for example. So there are still, and, and that's why we need the, the ethical layer, um, that's why we think we need the ethical layer on top of the, the PR platform, um, to really take into account those issues and, and to see how can we solve this and how can we help the citizen deal with these uh, very sensitive data and what they want to share uh, or what they want to know themselves, maybe. Yes, and I uh, in my view, um, data needs to be fit for purpose. So it's not just any data, it needs to be something that, that is meaningful for, for the use that it's being used for. If there is no other question, maybe. Um, yes, we put together some questions ourselves for, for discussion amongst ourselves, but maybe if there's input from you, we're, we're happy to hear from you as well. Um, it's about yeah, all the, the, the regulations that are being put into place, and, and I think we, we saw in, in this session and also in, in other sessions that, that is the, the citizen really at the center? Are they really being empowered? Um, and, and that's what we want to discuss today. Um, so firstly, I, you have a lot of um, organizations nowadays eh, that they say they want to empower the citizen, put them in control of their own data or health data. Um, but it's, it's very unclear how they do this in practice. Um, and it gives the impression, I, I think I use the, the comparison with greenwashing, that you know, have empowerment washing or, or control washing, that you, you seem to be in control of your data, which you're actually not. Um, and, and it brings into mind when we first had the GDPR uh, being implemented, a lot of companies said, yes, yes, we are GDPR proof, we are GDPR compliant. But it, had, it was an empty box, it had no meaning behind it. Um, so I think the, the, the idea is with all the regulations that, that we have, all the claims of empowerment and citizen-centric approaches, um, how can we as a citizen actually know um, that we have the control of the data that, that they claim we have? And, and how as an organization, organization, if you have best intentions, how can you prove that you actually are doing this? Um, and, and for the first question, if I, as a citizen myself, at this point, I, I wouldn't know where to start and how to know where I can trust uh, I can put my trust in where I have the control of my own data. So I'm happy to see if my colleagues feel the same. Maybe I would say that certainly based on the regulation, when you actually start that the data governance might be say, oh great, because now I'm going to have a tool which is going to mediate my data, so at least 
If I get my data, some, some people or some organization will be managing them. Thank you. I think that was a great start. And if you like to be going to the Data Act, again, data portability, everything will be possible to get data integration uh, for other organizations. Um, I don't like the public health authority, or the, the authority having access to my data without my consent. But when I look at the HDS, I think completely is involved. And um, as a citizen, I don't, well, the basic is it's just access to data, the sort of control to data. So whenever somebody says empowerment of patient, they feel like they have set a great world, and I completely agree with you. I don't think today patients are empowered and that's even disempowered in terms of, um, of the certain issues. No, the question is that um, what can we do to change this? I think everything exists in the regulation to do this. If we can build more on services on top of data intermediaries uh, to truly add value so that the citizen, as I was mentioning before, could actually manage all the, uh, the, each data through a mobile, then I think if organization can put that in place, we will actually be a much, much uh, uh, big step forward. But that requires thinking and the type of different applications based on different ecosystems. Um, I think the solution will be different, but that's the only way I think organization can truly involve citizens is by providing benefits with application using the data. Because most citizens are not interested in the data, they're interested in the benefit of the data. And so I think that's, that's where each ecosystem needs to look at what they can do. What do you think? <laughs> Um, I think that the, the European way seems to be a kind of regulation first uh, approach that, that uh, but there is a lot of regulation uh, even on, on the European level now, now we have to kind of some big fight data regulations under the European data strategy and then, then we, we still have GDPR and, and we, we will have the European health data space. I don't think too many patients have actually read, or many European citizens have, have read, uh, and or or are aware of their rights under these new legal instruments. It's it's, uh, it's just too much for uh, for for many people, and, and uh, th there is this kind of uh, a problem of access to justice. So in principle, you might have a lot of rights, but if you're not able to access your rights, then what's the use of all those rights in, in practice? So, um, so maybe maybe the, the problem is not uh, the absence of rights, but it's just just creating a, a simple enough simple enough system, uh, like a one unified system for Europe that that really works. Yeah, I agree. I think if, if looking at how organizations can really show that yeah, they want to empower and give the control, maybe in, in the transparency communication scheme, uh, because a lot of people don't know what, what, what is actually happening in all those acts and regulations, we know, but um, my mother doesn't. <laughs> um, but yeah, about benefits that could be for her is something that organizations that are really wanting to take these regulations and make it, make it better. Uh, they can explain um, or, or be more transparent and work on a digital and health literacy maybe um, to have more informed citizens as well. Um, so I think that's an important part. And really the co-creation, the, the working together with the, the citizens as well. Yeah, and we have a, a reaction here. Just uh, instead of consent, instead of that, I'm going Was just an example. Instead of giving consent, then it's a consensual purpose. But if if I instead, if instead have a contract with the benefits, then I can measure if that benefit is fulfilled. Wouldn't that be better? Because then giving consensual purpose, that is one thing. But I really like to see the benefit, so I can go go to a lawyer saying, "Well, I didn't get that benefit." Could we change that? To have that in, in a 
in the contract instead of here. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Harris. You from Burgers. This is the year we spoke extensively about regulation, uh, the Data Act, and the Data Governance Act. Um, uh, I think what you just said here is, is really very true. The thought of benefit indeed is very interesting. Um, but I, I have a problem, and maybe you have a solution. I hope so. The problem is this. Um, if you want to give citizens control of their data, and giving wage there should be benefit, that goes without saying, um, there should be data intermediary services or data processing services, which are not the same in the Data Governance Act and the Data Act. And these service providers should act on behalf of the citizen. So, but, so who's going to pay for it? That the citizen already pays with providing their data, that's the asset. So should they be paying as well? So and then who then should pay the data processing or data uh, intermediary service um, other than the citizen if, if he acts on his or her behalf? And to me that's a catch too. Uh, I would love to hear your thoughts on this. Thank you. Well, one, one quick sort of that cooperation. Uh, so, if you have this uh, citizen uh, cooperation where the citizens own this, that could be one solution. Yeah, cooperative. Yeah, that. Yeah, and it, uh, to be honest, from we're developing, we want to make it sort of a, a, a cooperative structure to really involve the citizen as well. Um, I think you have, you have different components when, when you're talking about helping people um, share the data. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. You have the data intermediary role that you have over the platform. But also, like, when you have somebody dealing with a financial, maybe you have a family member, you can maybe also designate a family member. And it's also something that is not paid today. Um, uh, I help my parents with, with some of their, their health issues or, or when they're moving and it needs short stuff out, it's too complicated for them. Um, so you have on different levels, I think you can, you can have an intermediary role. Uh, and then you have sort of a bank-like um, role you can you can have as well. Mm -hmm. So I think yeah, it, it has different layers and different solutions. Probably. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, the, did you pay for your bank account? Yes. Not much, but you do. And then you you, you pay just on the monthly basis. Why couldn't you pay for your data account? And um, if your data are of high quality and they are shared, you would be reimbursed. I think that's where we need to think in a completely different way about data. And nobody wants to, not enough people, want to realize that data should be treated as an asset, like your cash. I can promise you, coming from pharma, data is a lot of money. We speak about billions, about getting the data for supporting to be controlled. So I don't see why. You cannot manage your data as much as you manage your cash through a data account and the data account, data intermediary like we are, can actually manage sharing those data because they have value and at minimum you will be reimbursed for the cost of your account. But if you have your account and you do nothing with your data, well it takes space, it takes storage, so that for you that you pay. So I think we need to be open to completely new model, but I think the model of the bank account as we have today Personally, it would make a lot of sense to be. We don't speak about a lot of money. We speak for each citizen of a little bit of money, which is, and you can improve that yourself. But I'm sure there are other models, but that's one personally I believe it's simple, it should work. And when we discuss with banks, they say, well, that's exactly the same thing we do. Why do we make it complicated? But I know there's ethics. The Commission doesn't want to start to put data as something you can sell because they say, oh, the poor will be the ones that need the data for because they need that. I'm not sure it's necessarily true, but there needs to be more discussion about the ethical model about selling your data for me or for fee or for benefit or for whatever. So, anyway. so the data trust, so you know the market data trust, where you have people saying on your 
I, I, I think what you mentioned here is uh, what is called data trust. I think the model is from the yeah, it's the same, similar as that. Um, for for real diseases, um, uh, it's probably about one fifth of the uh, the uh, budget of of the uh, uh, local uh, health authority that goes into treatment of, of rare diseases, and that they are clear. If you think I'm thinking about the kind of the business case of of um, re reducing that public expenditure. Uh, yeah, you can say that uh, that for for example, if you can get the diagnosis faster, you, usually that now takes more more about six years, more or less uh, like uh, up to six years can can take even longer, uh, and the diagnosis is not that accurate. It's it's, uh, it's only up to sixty seventy percent accurate. Uh, and that leads to kind of a diagnostic odyssey. So a patient can be kind of within the system, they can have in, a lot of infections, but no one thinks that they, they might have a, a immune deficiency or, or some sort of disease of the immune system. And uh, those patients are very expensive patients. Uh, so if you can improve the diagnostics, you can also cut costs and, and uh, it makes much more sense for, for the, also reduce the, the suffering and, and time uh, in there. So that, that's kind of the main main area where you can have uh, meaningful inputs. Yeah. Okay, we're nearing the end of the session. See that the countdown <laughs> uh, nearing uh, the last minute. Um, so we'll leave the, the last um, discussion question to you to muse over um, for the rest of the day um, on what, what we can do to involve the citizens more if they've been heard enough um, and, and what we can do to work, uh, to work towards really empowerment. And maybe let's, let's all just give one takeaway what we, what we think um, is needed uh, towards really empowerment. And if I can start, I think it's, it's really about informing and, and involving the citizen um, all the relations and the rights that they have, and, and what could mean, uh, what, what this could mean for them in the future, actually. I completely agree, and I think what is, for me, we have to make a difference between what is done for the patient, because a lot of people think that by doing things for the patient is empowering me, which is obviously true. It's about what can be done by the patient. That's where you have true engagement, empowerment, and greatly building trust. And uh, well, well, yes, in, in, in the same way, I, I think we need a, a kind of a single European uh, system, and we also need a simple European system. Uh, that's pretty much it. That's a very nice way to end. <laughs> thank you, and thank you also uh, for the nice discussion uh, from you. <laughs> And that means that we will break now for an hour. Lunch is outside. We'll reconvene at 1 p.m. And we have a data stewardship session.